Okay, people, we are ready to look at page four, humanism. Okay, so there are, again, a couple of topics that come out of this renaissance, and I think already I have explained to you that the College Board is never going to ask anything that the general history student would know. So there will be very few questions about art. Yes. I did. Thank you, Ben. I did. I remembered. And I appreciate you asking me that every day. So do our two virtual kids. All right. So there will not be a whole lot of questions about art. However, we got to know a whole lot about art because most of the art is in writing questions. So that'll be another sidestep that you'll feel like you're taking art history as well. Those of you that love art, this is awesome. Um, but what we need to know about art is not necessarily what you think we need to know about art. We need to know about how art connects to history and how those two things are interconnected. Um, but in this chapter 10, the things that we'll be asked the most about will be political issues, changing how the Renaissance changes, because again, we call it a rebirth. And it is a rebirth of, of, of Greek and Roman ideals, but it's also a rebirth of the individual human, that the human being by itself is important. The church doesn't take that big of a view picture of individuals. The church takes the big picture of the whole. And again, if we were to stop and, yes, ma'am. What was the word that was relating to Greece? Greco? Is that the word? Is that it? Woo! I hardly ever get it on the first time. Greco. Um, if we were to drop ourselves back into and around the city-states around the 1450s and ask regular people, who is the most important person in your life um, uh, as far as an influence? It would be the Pope. Hands down, Pope. Every time, Pope, 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 Pope for most of Europe, especially if we move out into the rural areas. Who's the most influential person? The Pope. So the church is the most important thing in the average person's life. What we are seeing transition in the Renaissance is that movement from the church to leaders. Be that leader, a king, a queen, something but we're shifting that and it's a rebirth and one of those things that's going to occur is that this idea of humanism is the idea of thinking of people as individuals and not as a group right not as a group so the characteristics of humanism is first a revival of antiquity that's Greece and Rome the College Board loves to say antiquity so you need to make sure that you understand that that is Greece and Rome and they lump them together so if you just remember one of them you're good we just lump all that and actually the, the, the complete term is Greco-Roman we just lump all that stuff together but you don't have to remember it's Greco-Roman yeah Hellenistic to be Greek. Yeah, that's the other word. We don't use that in this one, though. That, that's, that's okay. Um, and we're reviving those in the terms of philosophy, literature, and art. And our problem with that is how do we reconcile this great civilization's writings, their literature, their scientific advances, and the fact that they're pagan? that they believe in a lot of different gods. How do we justify a Christian society more or less having a culture worship with Greeks and Romans? How do we do that? And we come up with this thing called humanism. We kind of mold it into now it's okay for Christians to believe in this society guided by pagans and not only just guided by pagans, but guided by people that believed in that those gods that were just woo wackadoodle crazy. So, a two strong belief in an individual and the potential of human beings. And this will be where we'll start to kind of get some pushback from the church. Um, Middle Ages people are small, wicked, inconsequential. 
And then we have this idea of virtue, 2A, the quality of being a man, the idea of excelling in one's pursuits. Number three, focus first on studying of ancient languages. And again, um, it will be Latin and then Greek. And it's the reason why um, very serious students of um, uh, theology or uh, Christian writings, they all learn Latin and Greek. Um, and uh, again, it's because that is essentially what the first um, books of the Bible, that's the language of which they were written, is Latin and Greek. Um, rejected Aristotle views of scholasticism in favor of, so we get rid of Aristotle, and we're going to take people like Cicero, Livy, Virgil, um, and again, people like Plato. Early Christian writers, especially the New Testament. And number five is really key, believed in the liberal arts education. This is the foundation of education in Europe. This idea of grammar, rhetoric, rhetoric is speech, so knowing how to public speak poetry, history, politics, and philosophy. For the most part, until we get, and especially in the United States, until we get to the 1950s, this is it. This, is, this would have been what you have studied. Notice there's no math, and notice there's no science. That is not going to occur and change in curriculum until the space race in the 1950s and Russia wins. And then all of a sudden, we gotta start having um, math and science in uh, schools. And so the second part of humanism, and humanism is a big one, right? We'll have lots of questions about that. But we'll have more questions about this subgroup called civic humanism. Education should prepare leaders who are active in civic affairs. And when you think civic, think politics, think city government. Civics is that kind of a thing. It's, it's taking care of government types of things. Some of the most important humanists will also be important political leaders, and that's the um, attachment. So civic humanism will be those people that say we need education to help us create leaders. Now, if we're thinking about in the modern 2020s, that'll be building roads and building schools. In civic humanism, it will be those that begin to take care of the state, meaning, and when we say the state, we mean the nation. like what's in the best interest of France, and that's what we should do. And not always what's in the best interest of France is in the best interest of the people. So make sure that you understand that civics does not mean taking care of people. It means taking care of government and taking care of the state of the state or the state of the union. And then lastly, we've got some words that we're going to talk about a lot. And that word is secular. And it's very simple. Secular is non-religious. Often humanism was more secular and lay dominated. Now again, this is when it's awesome to be Catholic because if you're Catholic, you know what the laity means. Laity means those people not ordained. So the laity in a regular church setting in the 21st century would be someone that teaches Sunday school or someone that runs like the youth group if your youth group is not a pastor. But the laity are people in a religious setting that are not ordained, meaning they don't have a degree, they haven't taken uh, oaths, they haven't taken orders. It's the normal people that run the church, the lady that plays the organ your ushers, the deacons, whatever you call your, um, um, you get to be one. Oh, okay, I was gonna say, what happened to the Catholic Church that you get to be? Now, here's the other part that will often happen, and it comes up quite often, especially when we get to Martin Luther, about females in church. Um, there is still a great divide in churches that allow females to participate, a whole lot. And it usually calls a lot of controversy. I just, in the history teacher reporting, you can go talk to the leader of your church about that. It always happens that somebody in this class will start thinking about, yeah, only ladies get to be Sunday school teachers and play piano. They don't get to be elders or deacons or stand in front of a pulpit. I have a friend that for some unknown reason decided, I shouldn't say that, she had a great calling 
to the ministry and she went to Baptist and she became a Baptist minister where no Baptist church in the South is going to let a female stand up on Sunday morning. It took her a long time to find that out. Um, and that is a long history that is best dealt with with you and your church. But at this point, the laity will always be man. Let me get Ben's question. They'll always be men, and there'll be a wide divide of which churches allow females. Yes? You said something about secular. Secular means non-religious. Okay? So, like, you're getting a secular education now, non-religious. What did she do? Went back and redefined her life. I actually, I think she did a lot of mission work first. She did a lot of mission work, and then she had she went back to college. But yeah, she's like somebody should have told me. I said, Jana, honey, where do you think we're living? You ever seen a woman standing up in Sunday church? I wish somebody would have told me. I'm sure they're thinking, why did we have to tell you? So anyway. And again, that was, let's see, when we got to, that was 1985, even still, so even more so. All right, so we're going to get our first giant list of names on page five. And sometimes names are really important, like Machiavelli. Machiavelli's name is really, really important. And then sometimes we just got a whole bunch of names on this page that I'm just giving you these names so that you're familiar with them. And I will try really hard to tell you that this is a person that you need to know, and this is just general information for the Renaissance. So Machiavelli, yes. Patriarch, yes. You need to know his name because he is the father of humanism. And he dies well before our time period, right? He's going to die in 1374. Our time period starts... 1450. The guy's been dead over almost over 100 years, almost 100 years before we need. But because he is considered the father of humanism, we need to know him. He is also considered the first modern writer because he didn't write about religion. He is the beginnings of this secular movement toward what we would think of as philosophy. That the meaning of life, the definition of life, the way of life is defined outside of religion. And now, here's the part again where in history classes we talk about religion differently. When we talk about the idea of moving away from the Catholic Church or moving away from any church, what you need to think about, again, are two things. One, the control and hold that the church has over the population and money. When people move away from the church, money moves away from the church. And the only way that the church makes money at this point is two ways. One, they charge rent to the people that live on the lands that they own and tithes. And I think I've mentioned this. If I haven't, I will say it again. You know, that whole what superpower would you have? I would be invisible. And the very first place I would go is the Vatican. And I would get in their archives. That would be the very first place I would go. I would, I would get, what'd you say? Shouldn't that be part of that? Treason? No, I'm not. That's not treason. I'm not a, I am not a oh, yeah. citizen of the Vatican. So, no, not treason. It would be, um, um, what? Trespassing. Very much trespassing. Yes. <laughs> very, very much trespassing. Awesome. Very much trespassing. Um, but uh, the thing about that is, for instance, when... Pope Benedict finally says in the year, I think 2011, sorry Galileo for putting you through the Inquisition and putting you on house arrest for your theory that the earth moved around the sun, that it was correct. When Pope Benedict made, and that was an official, it was official thing, Pope's there, in this box that just looks like a white gift box are the actual records from that Inquisition that he's holding and putting his hands on. I would like to put my hands on that. <laughs> Patriarch? Yeah, Patriarch. Close. Uh, yeah, Patriarch. Yeah. Um, this is, again, this is when we talk about how did we get out of the Dark Ages? Patriarch. So the Dark Ages, better known now as the Middle Ages, is this time period 
when man, and let's just make sure we understand why they're called the Middle Ages and Dark Ages. It is because that time period was so difficult that all people could do was think about living. We're not writing, we're not exploring, we're not scientifically advancing, which we do, but not really. But that time period had so many things, thank Black Death, that the only thing you were doing was surviving. And how do we move out of that? We move out of it because a black plague slowly dies. But this idea of movement toward education and knowledge is what Patriarch gives us. Perhaps the first to use critical text analysis. Again, this movement. And then he's going to write his famous poetry in Italian. Write it in the vernacular of which, again, he speaks. Then we got this whole big group of people, um, first to use the term humanism, uh, Lawrence Valle, false uh, donation of Constantine. The, excuse me, on the bottom of page five, the only thing about uh, Valle that you might want to make sure that you look at is E3, errors in the Latin Vulgate. The Latin Vulgate is the Roman Catholic Bible at the time. And he's going to start to notice some errors, some things that are incorrect, which is not a good thing to do. Not a good thing to do. All right, so let's flip page. We've got a couple of more people. Um, on page six, but the la on that page, the last book that we need to know is uh, Castellon, the book of the courtier. That's the last on that page six. And a courtier is a young man that goes to court for very specific reasons, to make um, attachments, to find a wife, to advance their family, to catch the eye of the king. And this book tells you how to do that correctly. It is the most important work of Renaissance education. So this book pops up a whole lot as to what you should do or be as a young man in the Renaissance. Specify qualities necessary to be a true gentleman. This is what separates us from the minions. And it's really important. This continued separation between us and them. And again, the us is about 8%. 8%. Population in Europe is about 8% noble birth, 2 to 4% the church, about 90% everybody else. And the, what we will spend this whole course studying is how that 10% controlled 90%. Do what? Separated. It separates the classes, right? So this it's a class system that this 10% up here controls all these people down here. So you would think, and it's going to happen at certain times in the history of Europe, that these peasants will rise up. In my head, I'm singing Hamilton. Rise up. It doesn't work. It never works. Peasant revolts never work. Why does 90 people, let's just think, put 90 people against 10. 90 people storming 10 people. Why does it not work? What? Say it louder. Oh, organization is good. But money a little bit because money's going to buy us weapons. You got a pitchfork. I got a gun. That might work and kill one or two, but initially we're going to always win. And, and the money and then that we control. And then the other part of this will be the church. The role that the church plays in minimizing or in ma <clears throat> maximizing the role of the nobility and the church. obligation to the church? 
But when I'd be like, okay, I guess I'm cool with being a peasant. Like, okay. okay, so when we talk it's about like that, that, when we talk about historically speaking and the church, again, we're not going to talk about the thousands upon thousands of priests who are doing truly the work of the church. They're just doing their stuff. We're going to talk about all the ones that aren't. Because historically, those are the ones that have a bigger role. So, obviously, there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people who enter the church to truly do the work of the church and do the work of the church. But just as many that join the church to maximize some kind of profit off of the church. Um, if you are a, of a noble family, and I don't, when I say noble, it's not always king. Noble just means you have a title. So let's say that um, my husband and I are very fortunate and we have um, four sons that live. One son is the, is the inheritor. Nothing can be split up, right? That's one of the ways that we guarantee controlling. So if you are the first son, you get everything. Second, third, fourth sons, they get nothing. They don't get a parsh. Like your family, let's say your family... Your dad made this big, awesome invention, and he gets billions of dollars. He becomes the Bill Gates, and when he dies, he splits what he has between you and Sophie equally. That's modern. But in the time period that we're studying now, only Sophie would get it. You would get nothing. Zero. Because the idea is to keep this land intact and whole so that nobody can end. It's really hard to own land anywhere in Europe. In, 20, in the 21st century because it has belonged to families for so long. So then those second, third, fourth sons, they got to find something. And as the noble of this family, I need connections. So I'm going to send one of those to the church to make that connection. Hopefully, maybe I find a son that has some kind of religious connection or feeling, but most often not. And most often that son is sent to the church to make some kind of political connection or some kind of power connection. And so that's where we get. Yes. Does the first son have his generosity discovered? Nope. Nothing can, be, nothing can be split. Nothing can be split. The land is not allowed to be split. Can he out? He can, he can put them on a payroll, but they can't. That And that ensures that 90% of the population never get up to own land because land ownership, it, stepping away from European history, that's the draw to America, right? That's why so many people come because there's land to buy. There's no land to buy. Even, even in the 20th century, when we lived in California, there are uh, tons and tons of refineries and oil companies which one of them was BP, so there's a large group of, of uh, Brits and Scots, and one of my really good friends was Scottish, and that was the fascination they had was that there's land and anybody can buy it. I worked with a guy from Taiwan, the same thing. He's like, I can't believe you guys let me buy a house in your country. We would never let you, I, we would never let you buy a house in our country. We would never let you have the attachment to land. And it's one of the things that makes America so different from other countries that one, we allow anybody to buy land, anybody to have it. Um, and there's no qualifications to own land versus in Europe where it's all been bought up and the idea is not to parcel it down into smaller pieces. So that's an important part. So that's the idea of a gentleman. And I don't know where we got off on that topic, but it's important. Make sure you remember it. Um, the book of the courtier, qualities to be a true gentleman, physical, intellectual, um, making sure that you uh, had an active lifestyle. One of the important things is having uh, I never know if it's in this book or not, if it was in the book, having a well-turned calf. So think about all the, the pictures you've seen of gentlemen, and they always are standing, you know, with their calves out. They got their toes pointed like this. It's to show a calf. But guess what? They got an implant in there. It ain't the real calf muscle. It's an implant. It's a plant. 
it's an implant, not like in through the um, skin, but it's an implant they put so that they have a well-turned calf, that that calf muscle, calf muscles are really hard to build up, they're really hard to define, but you start now that I have mentioned that to you and you look at all the pictures of those men with their high heel pointy shoes turned out and they can be 300 pounds, but they got calves like nobody's business and it's because it's an implant. And it's just some usually made of sawdust or something that well defines that calf muscle. Yes. Is it just like in their sock? Or yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And it's tied on. No, it's not an implant like what we do stuck inside. I don't know why I did that area, but yeah. Um, but yes. Um, and then the, the, the idea on this one is crude getting rid of those social habits, you know, blowing your nose, eating without utensils. Again, this is always a thing that I just like to throw in because it's cool. Those of you that read a lot, maybe you have read those historical books about trenchers and eating with trenchers. It's like eating a bread bowl at Panera Bread. That's what you had. That's what your meals were delivered in. And you ate and you shared. That was like the ultimate um, betrothing item was sharing a trencher and eating with your betrothed. And uh, you ate out of the trencher with the... Um, using the bread, no real silverware. You carried your own silverware with you. It wasn't, uh, eating habits were atrocious, atrocious. And this is the beginnings of setting up some type of um, um, decorum around things like eating and socializing. So I just have thought about this. Why did they have to put something in there that they couldn't just put, like, here, 50 cents? Oh, the calves? Yeah, because it was painted. Oh, well, I guess. But they walked around like that, right? Like, that was an attraction. Like, like it, 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 it was part of the whole idea of being a well-turned-out man. And if you, again, especially, probably not unless you're very, very well-read, do you ever hear that term, that term, well-turned-out? And it is, again, noting that calf muscle, that that calf, and I don't know why we get on that calf muscle, other than the fact that they've got short pants, right? They're going to wear short pants for a really long time. Short pants are going to be around till the 20th century. Short pants at your knees. So, um, describing the, uh, the ideal Renaissance man. So, this is, again, on C at the bottom of page 6. A really good list to kind of put in your head. Well-versed in Greek and Roman classics, an accomplished warrior, music, dance, modest, confident, personal demeanor, and again, this idea of virtue. That virtue is um, the nobility of being a great man in whatever noble pursuit. Notice, this is important, that there is nothing about, and I always assume, and I should stop doing this, but nobles don't work. They do not have jobs. They don't have any jobs. So they need things to fill their time. They don't have jobs. The way they get money is rents on their land. They are land rich, cash poor. Oftentimes don't pay their bills. Lots of times don't pay their bills. But they don't work. They don't have jobs at all until we get probably until the end of the 19th century where they will begin to have jobs. So they have to fill their time. What the heck are they going to do all day long? Yes, ma'am. The nobility. The nobility, they do not have jobs. Now, some of the jobs eventually that they will have that, seem, that will seem really, really weird to us is eventually as we develop a nobility, they will have jobs in the king's court. Right? So there will be a man of noble birth that the, is their job to empty the king's chamber pot or dress the king. The chamber pot's where he's going to go pee and poo. Or to keep the dogs. Those will be noble of, of noble birth, very noble birth, because those are highly desired jobs because you have the ear of the king. You are in, someone's going to dress the king. And it's not like a butler or a poor person. It is people of noble birth because they don't have anything else to do. Um, 
So that takes care of that setting up of the nobility. The next important thing before we move on to the Renaissance is the printing press. And I would draw a giant box around this on page seven because it is significantly important. The printing press by Johann Gutenberg. Now, one of the things that's important is when we talk about the printing press and the college board is very, very specific is that Gutenberg develops movable type. He does not invent the printing press. That's kind of what we talk about in lower level classes like world history or maybe in um, junior high that Gutenberg invents the printing press. He does not invent the printing press. He invents and develops movable type. So prior to Gutenberg, if I was going to print this piece of paper, I would have to carve the entire thing out of wood. Carve it. And then once I print all of this, what can I do with that wood carving? Nothing. It's why the printed word was so expensive and so valuable. So if you think about a book, every page of a book had to be carved out of wood. And then when it was done, I can't use it again. That was the way printing was done. It was done and created in wood. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. So if you're like printing multiple copies of the same Yes, you printed as many copies, okay. but once that page was done, it's done. So what Gutenberg gives us is a movable type, the individual letters that we can reset. Gutenberg starts as a, a goldsmith. <clears throat> and the importance of this is number two the spread of humanistic literature to the rest of Europe. Once we get to that, normal people, and normal people are those lower and lesser nobles. When I talk about the 90% that's in the other part of the population, in that maybe 3% are going to be that upper middle class, lawyers, doctors, scientists that can afford books. So that again, will create with astonishing speed. No longer would hard copies need to be done by hand. And um, Mainz, Germany in 1457 will publish the first Bible. And again, this is what gives us the spread of the Reformation. We're not in the Reformation, that's our next chapter, but that will be the spread of the Reformation. And Gutenberg is credited with that, even though he has a giant staff of people that are gonna do all those things for him. He begins his work as a goldsmith, that's his profession. He makes jewelry, and in the making of that jewelry, something clicks in his head about movable type. And so what that means, and I always assume that you guys know what it means, but I'm gonna talk because I don't know anymore that anybody knows what that means. So what that means is there are letters, just like my goofy little letter board there, right? My pink letter board, that's what I have to do. I have to pick letters and put letters on there. That's movable type. And that's where we learned those awesome things, uppercase and lowercase letters. Capital letters were on the uppercase, Lower little letters were on the lowercase. Has nothing to do with where you write them. If you tried to figure that out when you were in elementary, if your elementary teachers tried to tell you that, it has nothing to do with where you wrote it on that dotted line. It had to do with where it was located in the printing press that these men were making. And so what they would do um, is lay it out on paper and um, take a press, and it kind of looks like a wine press, but a press that would print in the press it onto the ink, and then move it. Still really expensive, because all of this is done by hand, but it allows people access to the written word, and that's what the printing press is gonna do to the Renaissance. The Renaissance and the Reformation does not happen without the printing press, without Johann Gutenberg's printing press. And then one of the first things they're going to print is the Bible. And they're gonna print the Bible in the vernacular so people can read it in their own language. And that will be really, really important. Yes, Ben? So, could they go through, like write the entire thing out and realize that they made a mistake? Oh, they make lots of mistakes. They still make lots of mistakes. I find books all the time where they have typos and things and it drives me nuts. Not that I have anything to say because 
do that a lot. All right, so we'll stop today on Italian Renaissance art. We're going to fly through that art tomorrow because the art part, again, is not um, as tested as you would think. Because, again, here's what we have to think about. We've got two test sets of question writers when we think about the AP exam. We've got the group of people that are writing the 54 multiple choice questions. Those are the ones we don't like. And we have the people that are writing and grading the written part of the exam. Those are regular teachers, right? So the multiple choice questions, and I want you to think about this. In that entire book, and we're going to fill two binders of notes, there are 54 questions. In those 54 questions, there, let's just, they average to three questions per excerpt. So what's 54 divided by three? What? So basically there's 18 questions. Do you know it that fast, Emma? Yeah, I'm Okay. So basically there's 18 questions. 18 different questions about a whole year's worth of work. Just saying. 